Welcome to our fourth edition of Open Salon, dedicated to the art of the future, imagining a way out of the crisis. My name is Martin Rauchbauer. And I'm Clara Bloom. And we are your hosts today. When the present sucks, what is left for us than to imagine a better future? The art world in particular has many reasons to complain about the present. 62% of artists have become fully unemployed because of the corona pandemic, while 95% have experienced substantial income loss. Galleries, museums and performance spaces are either closed or only slowly opening up in some places and subject to heavy restrictions. And then there's the worsening economy which poses the question, can we still afford the arts or have they become the least of our worries? Well, we think that art is not a luxury, but a necessity. Let's just look at Netflix. It gained more than 16 million new subscribers in the first three months of the year with the beginning of the Corona outbreak. Spotify, for example, um, has a third more monthly active users than before the pandemic. But especially in times of crisis, art is so much more than merely beauty, entertainment, or decoration. Art has the capacity to heal, in some cases even to save life. It brings us together even when we're apart. Art can help us make sense of the current events and guide us through the storm. And finally, and most importantly, we believe that art can help us imagine a way out of the crisis. So we have dedicated this first uh, art saloon uh, to these uh, topics and you can participate in two ways during our service and we're going to start with one in a moment and also through the chat and the Q&A function of Zoom poses our, your questions and we will include them in the discussion and let's jump right into it. We have our first guest from the prestigious Institute for the Future here in San Francisco, joining us, Ilana Lipset. She is the senior program manager there. And uh, while she is coming up to our panel, we sorry, you are... have to int sorry, Martin, please, in um, please let Ilana in. I'm having some difficulties. Okay, I will do that. Uh, and while we're doing that, we will maybe start with our survey. Um, so, let me see how I can reach Ilana. There we go. Uh, and we're going to start with our first, uh, hi Ilana, with our first uh, survey, which we're going to ask to all of the participants. And the question is very simple. It's about the future and we want to know how optimistic are you about it? How optimistic are you about the future? Very optimistic, a bit optimistic, indifferent, hardly optimistic, definitely not optimistic, terrified, you name it. And uh, we are clearly seeing here a trend. You can't see it, but you will see it in a moment. Uh, once you have all participated, um, give, it's your last chance to give your vote on your optimism and here we go. Here are the results. So, uh, well, a bit optimistic, that's, that's good. That's probably because we're in Silicon Valley here. Um, Ilana, the Institute for the Future based in San Francisco, you're the specialist for the future and you claim that teaching people about the long-term future helps them make better decisions in the present. In response to the crisis, your institute drafted up a series of post-corona scenarios. What are they and what can we learn from them? Yeah, well, thank you both. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning or this evening, depending on where in the world you are. Um, and yes, at the institute, we, we teach people to, make long, uh, to think about long-term futures, to make better decisions in the present. Um, and one thing I want to emphasize is that we don't make predictions, but we teach foresight to help people assess future possibilities and then create the future that they want by asking better questions, gathering better insights, and creating tangible actions that can create change. So a lot of it, a lot of future thinking is really about seeing new possibilities. Um, so with that, as you mentioned, we created a framework from which you can see what these future possibilities might be. Um, and if you want to bring up the slides, Martin, thank you. Yeah, number two. 
would be great. Perfect. So I know there's a lot going on here. Um, I'd love to invite people to visit our website where there is a full explanation of all of these different scenarios, um, iftf.org. Um, but essentially, we created these different scenarios in which um, future possibility from which future possibilities might emerge. And what I want to draw people's attention to on this slide um, is the, the the bottom right these three horizons of change. So kind of looking at um, three curves on which things will be changing, and we've named them respond, reset, and reinvent. So response is kind of this immediate action that people are taking right now to save lives. Reset would be midterm strategies to stabilize. Um, I don't want to say bring things back to normal because I think as we'll get into a lot of normal is not working for a lot of people. And then reinvent, which is really what you were talking about with what art has the potential to create, which is imagining new possibilities for a better world, a more resilient world. Um, so we took these three horizons of change and applied them to different scenarios. So if you want to move to the next slide, please. This is what we call the constraint scenario. So that would be one in which internal or external forces limit um, the scope of change. So there is change, but in a limited way. And in this one, um, what, is the, what does the future look like in a world in which there are limits to growth for a number of reasons, economic, environmental? And what we see is an emergence of a story of social solidarity. So now as we're entering this kind of social recession in which people are not able to gather with each other, are not able to enjoy cultural and artistic events and, and gatherings in person with each other, what are the ways that we can invest in um, social infrastructure and things that strengthen social ties, support social solidarity, like creative efforts, like mutual aid. Um, and then we're encouraging people to take these frameworks of um, moving up along these three curves and write their own stories. So if you want to move quickly to the next slide. Uh, we're asking people to, to, to use this framework to say, um, you know, what are you seeing as patterns of the past and what are indicators that things are changing and in what direction? So what are the values you want to see in the future and how do you, um, how do you put those into a story? How do you, what needs to happen? Um, and then the last thing that we're doing on the next slide, my colleague Jane McGonigal is sparking this global conversation around what is imaginable, where, where everybody's kind of saying these days, you know, oh, the unimaginable is happening, the unthinkable is happening. So what is imaginable? What is imaginable? And what do we want to see um, in 10 years from now? What is, what is a positive long-term adaptation or change you want to see as a result of this current situation? Um, what needs to change for us to be happy and healthy in the future? So we're inviting people around the world to add their views and their visions to this conversation. So I'd love to invite anyone who's, who's watching to um, sign up on that website. And I think, I think one of the major lessons in all of this is the need to see future possibilities and not just the ones that we want to see. So what are, what's the signal of a potential direction the world is going? Um, and if we don't like that, what are we gonna do to make sure it doesn't go that way? So I chose the social solidarity example because I do think it's important for people's psyche to paint a, a, a vision of a positive future. Um, but we also, you know, we've also created scenarios that show a much darker future with data and privacy tracking, with individual germ pods, with, with war. And I think it's important to create a big possibility space so that you're not blindsided by the reality that you didn't want to see. Fascinating. So what you're actually doing is um, raising awareness of what possible scenarios so that people can react much more informed if some were to happen. Um, let me just jump into the second question that is maybe more specific to the San Francisco Bay Area where the Institute is located. So many of the big cultural movements of the last century, such as the Beats, the Summer of Love and the Hippies, the Free Speech and the anti-war movements, have their origin in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so much of this art as activism, how much of this is actually still practiced today and how can it be mobilized in this current crisis? Maybe you could give us some examples. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and there is, there's so many amazing artists and arts organizations and cultural organizations in the Bay Area um, who are practicing art as activism or music with a message. Um, but I, if, if it's okay, I would actually like to broaden that question to the whole country right now because I think in is not just COVID. Um, it's not just COVID. Climate is a crisis. 
Minnesota is burning. George Floyd's murder is another tragic example that our country is in a social crisis. Um, and COVID has definitely exposed all the inequities that are embedded in our system and entire communities are being traumatized over and over and over again. And so I think art, you know, by no means is the only answer, but, but it does have a lot of potential to drive social change and can be really powerful in these moments, both for the collective healing that we need as we are experiencing this collective trauma and also to help drive social connections, um, especially in these times of our being physically distant. So I think some really beautiful examples that we've seen on social media are people singing, creating, making art, kind of collaborating as a way of showing global solidarity. Mm -hmm. um, and then as, a, as some specific examples, um, I, uh, if you want to bring up the slides again, there is, uh, yes, number seven, please, slide seven. Number There's seven. a, slide number seven, yeah. There's um, a nonprofit grassroots organization called the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture, which is not an official government organization, but they've been encouraging art as activism all over the country. Um, and so this is an example of their call for artists to um, use their art and use their craft to, as they call it, de-wonkify the Green New Deal and put out messaging <laughs> around um, what is the world, how do we make sense of, of the policy and of the science and what is the world that we want to see. Um, and if you go to the next slide. Uh, the YBCA, the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, which has been kind of um, such a cultural cornerstone of art and of art activism for such a long time in the Bay Area. They're hosting a whole series around the 2020 census um, because so many people, uh, so many groups of people in America historically have been undercounted and it matters. If you're represented, it matters. And so they're hosting a whole um, exhibit called Come to, or a whole exhibit and have this toolkit called Come to Your Census. Um, and this is one of the examples um, uh, of bringing bringing visibility and giving voice to black women and black black women artists mm -hmm. um and this is this is in the bay area so an example of that um and then the next slide again is not in it's not in the bay area but it's in california this is on the border of the u.s of california and mexico and it's an artist professor ronald Rial, who created these bright pink seesaws that cross the border and allow people to engage in play with each other. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's definitely defiant. It's a, it's a form of activism. It's whimsical. It's making people smile. It's, it's literally bridging a divide. Um, and I think it's a, an amazing example of public art as activism and as a way of bringing people together. Wonderful. Maybe, uh, uh, Ilana, just in one, in one sentence, uh, because you already showed it in so many examples, but in, in uh, as you are a community design strategist and engage with artists in your work reality, mm -hmm. in your experience, what is the role of art in times of crisis? Absolutely. I think, you know, I think we're, we as humans are hardwired to think about things as they are today. And it's really hard to envision what, what a future might look like. And so especially when you're in a crisis, it's, um, it can be really difficult to see beyond that and to see what else might be there. And so artists, I think, literally have the ability to paint the future and to act as futurists and show us what else might be possible. Um, I think they can also communicate messages in a way that's more visceral, more emotional, more tangible, more comprehensible. And so, um, you know, the, the UN had a call for artists to communicate messages related to COVID, both public health and also social solidarity. Um, and so, you know, I think historically we've seen, and this is not at all to, to glorify crises, um, but we've seen that existential crises like the one that we're in breeds innovation in both the form of entrepreneurship and art. And so I think that it is, um, there is a way that art provides healing and provides a vision and a way out of where we are. Um, there's the an, an amazing organization called Californians for the Arts, who um, mm -hmm. they're advocating for art to be, uh, excuse me, they're advocating for artists to be referred to as second responders. So really seeing them as essential workers who are willing to respond to a crisis like the one that we're in and provide hope and inspiration um, and distraction. And so we should honor them as such. Thank you. I mean, this is a wonderful summary and also a perfect way um, introduce our next guests. Um, art is this futurist. This is kind of the baseline of our work here at Open Austria as well. 
Um, so thank you so much, Ilana. That was abrupt, sorry. <laughs> thank you so much, Ilana, um, for this fascinating insight. Please check out um, their catalog of recommendations for post-COVID scenarios. It's fascinating to see. Get prepared for whatever scenario will come to, um, to happen. We'll see Ilana at the end of the session one more time. Um, and this is a moment where we'd like to introduce two fascinating personalities in the art and technology space. However, one of those um, guests might not have arrived yet because um, of, first of all, technical difficulties. And the second aspect is that there is an event happening simultaneously in Linz. So we'll start instead um, with our guest joining us from Berkeley, California. Vikram Chandra, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Vikram, you're on silent, just so you know, so. There we go. Here we go, excellent. Well, thank you for having me on. Well, it is, it is our pleasure. Um, Martin. Yes. You wanna uh, introduce Vikram? I wanna introduce uh, Vikram. Uh, he is uh, a wonderful uh, writer and a technologist, so really combines uh, those two worlds of art and technology uh, has uh, written some wonderful, very extensive novels, one of which, Sacred uh, Games, has been turned into a Netflix best-selling series or, or very, very popular series. Uh, and of course, uh, your latest uh, novel, Sublime Geek, uh, talks about this uh, fascination uh, that you have for both the art and uh, technology uh, world. Uh, I, I would like to uh, kind of um, start uh, with uh, asking you a very simple uh, question uh, since the theme of uh, today is the future. Um, Vikram, what is the future of literature and what is the literature of the future? Well, I think um, literature will continue to exist um, in its present and past incarnations for, I think, forever, which is to say that we will continue to tell stories and listen to stories um, for pleasure, for meaning, uh, for an understanding of who we are and why we are here. Um, and I think uh, I'm, I'm very skeptical of claims that anything dies, right? <laughs> so you off, every five years, there seems to be a cycle uh, in literary criticism that says the novel is dead. And as, I, as we can see, the novel thrives and expands every day. Uh, so I think, you know, the, the printed book, uh, the novel, the poem will continue to exist. What I see happening in the future is something that some of us uh, at least have dreamt about for a long time, is a kind of mixed media storytelling, right? So the, the, what we call ebooks right now and that we read on our tablets, they're very scroll-like. They actually look, often remind me of ancient scrolls from 5,000 years ago, right? And they're not very responsive. They're, so so I think what, what we'll start to see is uh, what, what you might call as book as active element, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. that you, you not only just click on a word to see a dictionary meaning, but the, the event of reading itself becomes in a sense mixed media. Um, and that's very exciting. Um, it's starting to happen in sort of little bits and pieces, but from the point of view of the artist, the writer, that technology is mostly too hard to use, right? It's, it's, uh, it's very geeky <laughs> and very impenetrable. Uh, so I think once we get more um, expertise on that end, I think uh, we'll start to see much more of, of that storytelling. The other area in which I think uh, I'm really interested in is collaborative storytelling, mm -hmm. right? Um, how do people across the world uh, can they collaborate not only on, on individual stories, but on an entire universe of characters or people or um, historical events, locations. Uh, so uh, what we see happening in a sense, these conversations across social media, but into the fictive play, uh, space, right? And also in, in other media as well, right? Uh, can, can we make films together? Uh, can, we, can we explore um, sort of virtual sculpture. I, I don't know how, I mean, often I think um, some of us, are, uh, we're, we're kind of um, blind to the possibilities of what's going to come precisely as the early filmmakers had to learn that they could actually make cuts, right? So maybe our kids will, who are growing up with this stuff will truly understand it and explore these areas. 
Absolutely. I mean, you've named it already, collaborative um, storytelling, collaborative um, filmmaking. So this is, this is where we could actually benefit from a retreat into the virtual realm, right? This new technology offers all those possibilities. So what is, what is gained and what is lost in this new um, um, uber digitized world uh, without physical contact? Well, I, I don't think we have to have one or the other, right? Because uh, one of the things that fascinated me, I, I'm going to, of course, forget, my daughters were playing this game where you could find creatures on your street, right? Do you, anybody <laughs> know what I'm talking about? You looked in your phone and you could like sort of find these virtual creatures on your sidewalks. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like Pokemon, isn't it? Like Pokemon po Go? Yeah. Yeah, 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 that, that, exactly. So, so I think there's a way to get both of these things working simultaneously together. Mm -hmm. and, and since the lockdown, it's been really interesting watching people deal with this, right? How do you have a socially distanced party, for instance, right? <laughs> and so, and then the whole uh, Netflix watching party, right? Where you're all yes. trying to watch the same movie together so you can create a kind of faux cinema hall. Um, so I think I'd rather not choose between the two, um, mm -hmm. that, that you can bring the analog and the digital together in interesting ways. Um, I, I think the danger of it is, as you're saying, a loss of, of contact, right? Of physical contact, of actual human interaction. I think that's very, very important. And if you lose that, you lose an essential part of being human. Um, and, and that Absolutely. has to happen at the same time. I couldn't agree more in that. And we want to now bring uh, the audience into the picture. And we've prepared our second survey, uh, which is uh, the survey um, on uh, the uh, intersection of kind of art and technology, which you are working on. But we would like to know uh, how uh, kind of technology is important for you when you think uh, about the future. So if you think about the future, is technology part of the solution or part of the problem? Uh, again, we are open Austria, we're here at Silicon Valley, so uh, the results that are coming in do not surprise me at all. Um, and I'm going to end the survey in a second. Uh, it's very interesting. I already see the results coming in. I'm ending it now, and uh, these are the results. 79% think that technology is part of the solution. Uh, very few people think it's part of the problem, and uh, some think it's part of the solution and part of the problem. This is a, a general sentiment, a little bit, which I wanted to feel a little bit, uh, how people feel about technology when it comes uh, to the uh, future. Vikram, do, do you agree with this uh, general sentiment? Is that, is, are you also... <laughs> largely positive when you when you think of the role if you if we think of technology and the role it can play for example in solving problems like the climate change or or now the current pandemic well no i mean i'm much more skeptical i i would go with the <laughs> part of both uh, uh the reason being that that uh, technology gives you leverage right so so using that lever you can move the world but you can also damage it and destroy it in many ways and destroy each other, right? And we've seen this, not just in the recent industrial past, but, you know, the first time somebody uses, uh, knows how to make a tool, you get, you know, which becomes useful, then you can start killing other people with it, right? You can start taking property. You can start setting up hierarchies of power. Um, and then the, the condition in which we find ourselves today is not incidental, it hasn't happened despite technology, technology has enabled that in many ways, right? And so climate change is not something that we achieve um, just, you know, through our, our hands. Um, and so, uh, and, and this ambiguity, right, of, of technology or power, um, of magnification uh, of power is something that has always existed and I think always will. And I think the paradox of it is that you can't predict when something enters the world what effect it's going to have, right? And I remember in the 80s and 90s, all the utopian visions that the, the tech revolution, the PC revolution, the internet, all of that engendered. 
And now, um, last semester I, at Berkeley, uh, I did a seminar, we call it the Humanities Tech Seminar. And it was impossible to find contemporary readings which actually spoke of the future and the present of tech with any sense of hope even, much less utopianism, right? And I was going, I was asking people in the industry, friends of mine, fellow technologists who were working. Um, and I think that gives us a sense of, of um, you know, the, the idea that information needed to be free, um, that, that uh, we would all enter a utopia of, of democracy through the internet. And if you look at the countries that I know best, India and, and the United States today, the amount of polarization and the, need, the sort of thirst for authoritarianism clearly has to do a lot with these, these models of communication that we now have. So, and I think again, um, this is where artists <laughs> can play a vital role, right? Because uh, the artists who, the writers, the sci-fi writers, uh, not, not the sci-fi writers, but who had been thinking about this for a long time, certainly have been writing dystopias and utopias for the last many centuries. So I don't think it's, it's as simple as saying, we're going to take today's problem and we're gonna solve them through technology. In fact, I think that kind of technological approach has its own blinders on and actually often leads to disasters. Well, that couldn't have been a better, better note to introduce Kevin Stocker. <laughs> Sorry for being so late, but not only did we have a concert that was a little bit longer than planned, but the main problem is that uh, since two weeks we are under big, uh, in a big turmoil because our servers have been severely hacked and everything had to be shut down, so we have the double lockdown at the moment. And uh, that's why it was a little bit more difficult now for me to get the right link. Thanks for Martin for sending me again, but now I'm with you. Excellent. Well, um, thank you, Vikram. We'll, we'll get back to that point after I quickly introduce our <laughs> next guest. Um, all right, so Gefried um, is an artist and a technologist, both, and he's also the artistic and managing director of the world's oldest and biggest art and technology festival. Um, which is located in Linz, Austria, and called the Ars Electronica. Last year, Jeffrey, you celebrated your 40th anniversary. Um, this year, the festival will have to deal with the ramification of a global pandemic. And in the light of a global um, lockdown and, and everything in social distancing, maybe answer this one question. Um, what is the future of festivals and what is the festival of the future? Well, I think the future of festival is the glory of their past. Festivals have uh, not only the reason to present good program, of course, but the major reason of festivals is the social interaction. And this is something that we humans always will need, no matter what the uh, health situation is with pandemics or no matter how far we are progressing into the digital world meeting physically, being together in a place among another audience and most likely direct contact with artists and other people. This is a sort of excitement that heightens our attention. We can perceive the art and the program much better, much deeper in this situation. We have an immediate possibility to respond and react with each other. And of course, the enjoyment is better, the, the uh, attention is uh, much deeper. So I think the festival of the future will be, uh, of course, festivals that are primarily in the physical space. What we see right now, of course, is that many of us who have the same problems are exploring possibilities not to dissolve and disappear in the networks, but to create a new type of uh, social presence that is connecting not only people in a local and physical space, but also connecting different places worldwide and uh, also bringing these places, so to say, in a sort of network where the festival can emerge and manifest itself in real physical spaces again, but connected with, with many, many places. And uh, uh, this is very exciting. Also at the moment, uh, it's still a very chaotic situation because planning for such events is very difficult. We don't know how things will change in the coming two weeks, in the coming two months. 
But yes, it's exciting. It really indeed sounds very exciting. Looking forward to the Ars Electronica under current circumstances in September of this year, and we will maybe get a glimpse into the festival of the future. Uh, Gerfried and Vikram, we brought the two of you together here in this section of our uh, open salon because we feel that you are both uh, fat, uh, really uh, representative of the world of technology and the world of art. You both are technologists and you are, have this sensitivity uh, of artists and you believe in, in art, uh, artists as futurists. Uh, we've had many conversations uh, with both of you. So uh, I would like to know a, a little bit uh, what kind of future are we talking about and wh why is art an important role there and what can it help us solve? Uh, a little bit of provocative question. Is art really, does really art have uh, this power when we think uh, of the global pandemic, uh, when we think uh, of the worst economic recession that is awaiting us, so we're in the midst of it already. Um, you know, all these kind of illnesses and problems that we are facing today, climate change, surveillance capitalism, and, and all that. Is really, do you really believe that art has uh, something uh, um, significant uh, to contribute in that? And we, I want to pose the question to both of you, whoever wants to, wants to jump in. Maybe, Gerfried, you want to start uh, since you joined us a little later? <laughs> okay, well, that's a good thing. Then you come later and then you get the privilege. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I think it is, uh, it's a question that uh, we can look at from many different perspectives. A very uh, uh, ironic but sad one actually would be to say when we see how much uh, our politicians worldwide are losing and messing around with uh, uh, the situation, well, even artists couldn't do it worse. So uh, that would be one way to see. Another way, of course, I think is whenever we talk about the impact of art, we are, of course, talking at something that in a certain way is very homeopathic. When you work as an artist or when you work in culture, and I think also education, you never know if you are the drop of water that is just evaporating on the hot stone and sorry, that's it. Or maybe you are one of the drops at least contributing to the big spillover of the bucket and influencing, driving, kicking off something that is really uh, changing. And as artists, we know that, you know, if we only can change the experience of one single person uh, at the evening with a concert, with a performance, with a lecture, with a program. Well, that's already uh, a super reward. And I think uh, we are so used to just listen to the hard facts of economy or science uh, that we often disregard the very important uh, aspect of this emotional, this spiritual, mental, this inspirational moments that uh, art is providing. But the good thing is, of course, what we see is that art has so many different faces uh, to, to, to work. Um, we have this art that is supporting us really, so to say, in our emotional household. We just had a wonderful concert that was finished with a beautiful, beautiful piece of music from uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. And after this, I mean, changes your life, at least for maybe the rest of the evening and the next day you can go into depression or frustration again. But in particular, what we see with our festival and uh, Clara, you were also participating this year in the jury sessions. There are so many artists out there who are not just producing beautiful experience or interesting, critical, analytic uh, commentary but they are really working on alternative models. They are proposing new ways to think about. And of course, it's not the role of artists to produce new products, to create new social solutions. But what they are doing is definitely, definitely uh, enriching our inspiration, kicking off our, the, the way how we can think of alternatives. And I think this is something we definitely need most at the moment. Wonderful. Become? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I completely agree with all of that. I, I was thinking also that um, the, the, the sustenance that the beauty of an artistic experience gives to us is very much part of being human, right? And has been with us since the days of the cave paintings, since the days of the first um, dancing, right? Um, 
and and so um, it's very very important not to underestimate that and then simultaneously with that when i read for instance a really good novel it's humanizing it's particularization of a particular process right it's easy to talk about oh i don't know the oppressions of communism for instance but but when i see it um in in incarnated in the lives of two people that makes it real to me right and also starts off uh, w- w- something that is also an aesthetic hope for justice right for a better way to live and i think that is so integral to our way of being is that we look for beauty in the future as well and then <laughs> completely disconnected from this or maybe in some ways um, you you were talking at the beginning about artists losing work during this pandemic of of becoming unemployed and one of the things that has been haunting me for the last few years uh, especially because i live in the bay area close to san francisco it's very clear as that as ai and robotics come online as more it, as they penetrate our world much more millions of people are going to lose their jobs right so so you know uh, people working on industrial floors will be are being replaced by robots um supermarket cashiers legal assistants um you know you can imagine this pen- going in all kinds of ways so the dystopian version of this is that you know a few people are tr- trillionaires and the rest of people are living on their scraps as it were right uh, uh the utopian version of this is something that i like to think about right and it's been interesting um even in silicon valley i've started to hear people talk very seriously about universal basic income right and so if we think in a utopian way about a world in which there is an abundance uh produced by let's say technology and its adjuncts what do we do what do we do right what is the meaning of life then right uh we've been told for so long especially during capitalism that our worth comes from our economic production and from consumption right endless consumption and and so then when i try and think of the meaning and hope in a world where we are elevated to a state where we don't have to struggle we are not terrified all the time i think art the humanities philosophy um finding meaning in poetry becomes even more crucial right because and so how, maybe this is a fantasy right it's my utopian fantasy but uh, a lot of writers have explored this especially in the last couple of centuries um and even people as you know sort of hard headed as marx and john K- uh, maynard keynes have have touched on this on their work right so if you find a heaven on the other side of oppression what will that heaven look like and and then the important question is how do we get there yeah i like this optimistic approach very much i have to say because there is uh, always this nice saying it's any way too late to be a pessimist <laughs> but <laughs> nevertheless i think there is still a lot to do and a lot of work and pressure uh, that we need to get in this direction uh, and i think this is definitely also another wonderful thing of art it's it's often so to say not the artwork itself but the impact of art is atmosphere that it creates the the hope that it also creates i mean if you see individual people or uh, groups of artists creating interesting exciting new work this is something that gives us also hope it says we can do it we can you know step in and we can get so to say on our feet and uh, really start to work on making this place a better world and it definitely needs a lot i think uh, when we look at the moment how things are uh, going on and happening uh, there is actually not very much <laughs> to be really uh, so to say excited about i mean uh, right now when we see the big uh, 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 um, protests going on in in minneapolis when we see what's going on in hong kong and again when we see how totally ignorant uh, many of uh, our leading politicians are i think one of the really dangerous things now is this question of uh, whether the, the the type of democracy that we have right now that we are used to that uh, many generations have been fighting so uh, strongly for 
that this will be really able to survive uh, this uh, period of time where we have the big monopolies uh, who are not only controlling the economy and mm. the money making anymore like in history, but who are controlling actually what we call the public opinion, the way how people think about things, the type of information that we can get. So I think uh, it's again for me to, to, to sort of make a statement for art, the wonderful thing is this duality. I mean, art is the, the sledgehammer that we need that is kind of, you know, really working for society to help us to uh, analytically look behind the curtain, to understand things that are going wrong, but at the same time not stopping there, but proposing alternatives that no other field of expertise actually can do. And I think mobilizing people is one of the important things also. And what we have really witnessed in, in the last, I would say, about five years, when we look in our big international award competition, what kind of submissions we get. There has been a strong increase of projects where artists are really, uh, as I tried to explain before, already taking up their responsibility and say, okay, I'm, I have to step out. I cannot stay so, so any longer in the comfort zone of just uh, producing what I would like to do as an artist. So I think this uh, type of activism is uh, quite often really a kind of sacrifice because it's not necessarily what you want to do as an artist. But uh, I think it's a responsibility that many are taking over and therefore becoming role models, I think, for other areas as well. That's again why it's so important to bring artists into technology, into companies, into research centers, uh, so that uh, technologists, scientists, and ideally also at some point, you know, we would bring artists in residence into politics and <laughs> have them. <laughs> so they may be uh, as a last hope uh, to make our politicians a little bit more aware of what's necessary. Well, um... I'm so sorry that I need to wrap up this session now. Um, we're on a schedule, but a lot of incredible things have been said. And as you know, um, at Open Austria, we're very invested in this idea to incorporate um, artists into tech development processes. Um, just a couple of takeaway messages. Aesthetic hope for justice. One of my favorite quotes. I will just copy it from now on, become thank you. Artist sledgehammer, I will take that with me as well. <laughs> um, and let's get those artists out of, out of the ivory tower and onto the streets. Um, thank you so much, become Thank you so much, Gabby, for joining us today. Please don't leave as we have a final question for you at the end of the session. So thank you so much. Um, and with that, we'd like to introduce our next guests. I'd like to start with Miroslav Wiesner, a 25-year music industry veteran and a specialist in avant-garde nightlife programming. He's the owner of Shufi, an international music agency. Um, he produced Mutex uh, Festival Soul US-based edition in San Francisco, and this year he's celebrating his third edition. So, Where is he? I'm right here. Hi, how are you? Hey, here you are. Hi, Miro. It's so good to see you. You as well, definitely. So here comes the first question. Miro, last weekend you pulled off something incredible. You pulled off Nexus, a virtual experience of Music San Francisco. It was free of charge for everyone. 100% of the donated proceeds went directly to the artists, and you relied on a handful of trusted partners to curate the content. So now we're faced with this reality that live performances have been canceled throughout the entire world. It will take years for musicians to um, recover from the loss of touring. And you're experiencing this impact um, of the pandemic on the music industry firsthand. So let's start off with this um, question, very broad. What is the future of music and what is the music of the future? <laughs> um. The future of music has been in turmoil for quite some time, to be honest. At least the ability to generate uh, livelihood and income from it, you know, ever since uh, we've devalued music as a commodity now rather than um, a product of work. Uh, we have a real issue with how artists and musicians are able to sustain themselves, um, certainly in uh, North American and specifically the United States as well, where there's very little support 
um, for creatives in that sphere. There are a couple of issues with it. Um, it's very difficult for many to decouple music practice from entertainment and celebrity and those uh, things that were discussed earlier in the panel regarding the ability to incite emotion and bring uh, collectiveness and a sense of togetherness are also weapons that are often used uh, by industries um, to make us feel a sense of nostalgia or move in a certain emotional direction. So um, the music of the future uh, will just keep trudging on the way that it is in my mind. Um, you know, we deal specifically with um, music and art that has an electronic or digital element to it, um, but obviously that's a very broad brushstroke. Um, so from that standpoint, I mean, there will always be new tools, there will always be new uh, ways to generate sound, um, and we will certainly see an increase in uh, remote collaboration, just like every industry will. But um, I think the, the uh, music of the future remains uh, as it is, which is trudging along and progressing as needed, referencing history as needed. Um, and uh, each uh, position, each uh, type of music has its place within uh, uh, socio-political conversations or um, psychological conversations uh, or escapism conversations, uh, all of which are valid. I think the problem is, is that populace um, consumption is uh, skewed, has been skewed towards the escapist use of music uh, historically, um, which again, there's nothing wrong with that. I like to forget about things myself as well. Mm -hmm. What I do think is interesting is when we went through the process of music being available uh, in ubiquity, like throughout the internet, uh, basically access to any piece of media, and this isn't reserved to music alone, this applies to all uh, creative um, media, performing arts and otherwise film. But when that happened, we kind of lost our filters. Uh, the idea of a label, the idea of a publication changed substantially. So there was a huge point of chaos we were all in. Where do we get uh, validation for the decisions we're making now that my access to content has exponentially increased by a factor of a thousand? Mm -hmm. Um, and interestingly, tools were built or social norms came from um, remote satellite interaction and all of a sudden people were making those decisions for themselves. They were finding their own filters, their own source of um, uh, boundaries for or uh, validation for what they wanted to listen to. So I think what's exciting to me is the collaborative element um, in terms of uh, the future of mu music. And frankly, if you listen to what's considered pop today versus even just 10 or 15 years ago, um, that impact of having access and um, every listener being exposed to all facets of music and other forms of media has really altered pop in a very positive way. And I think that even though we're still trying to find the appropriate economic model, um, music's growth will continue to be exponential and experimentation will continue to exist and hopefully be adopted more quickly by, uh, by a general populace. Thank you, Miro. And we're going to continue uh, the conversation with you. We want to have uh, another artist uh, join uh, from Austria joining us. Uh, I think it's a nine hour difference. Uh, I'm sorry oh. about that. Uh, that didn't work. We will see you uh, at a later uh, point. Um, Eva uh, Stocker, but we have uh, somebody else joining us in a moment. Um, let me just check that out. Uh, so we have Victoria um, Köln uh, joining us here, and I'm going to uh, say goodbye to Eva for now. We'll see you uh, in a bit later. So uh, we will now turn from music to visual arts uh, and welcome Victoria Köln uh, from Vienna. You're an Austrian uh, light artist who focuses mainly on public art uh, and you call uh, your legendary site-specific light interventions Chromotopia, if that's uh, the correct pronunciation, creating radically new and open urban artistic spaces. Currently you're working with us, with Hope in Austria, on the first Austrian Burning Man art project, Schrödinger's Rat, 
inspired by the famous thought experiment of Austrian quantum physicist uh, Erwin Schrödinger uh, playing with the notion of the multiverse. So there's a lot of burners right now in this, uh, uh, in this uh, universe. Uh, of course, Burning Man, uh, where in previous years more than 75,000 people gathered in the desert of Nevada needed to be canceled uh, this year. So I'm asking you, Victoria, how can art survive in the public space? Uh, and Burning Man, of course, is, is a weird example of a public space. Uh, at a time where people largely are confined to their homes. What is, and that's really the question, the future of public arts and the public arts of the future? Victoria. Yeah, many thanks to be invited to this great panel. It's great to hear you all and I love to uh, be part of it now without even Taking, the, uh, taking a flight or so. So uh, this is really something that is new and that is a benefit of the crisis. So if there are some benefits, this is one that I'm here part of this panel in a very simple way, yeah. Um, yeah, I th the question for me is how can art not survive? Because art survives since thousands, millions of years. So how can it not survive? We will always find a way to survive. And this is exactly the hope that is within the arts. It will survive, whatever will happen. Maybe it will be dismissed in some parts of the world, but there are others. Austria, for example, Vienna. <laughs> Here it might be a bit easier uh, because we have some support, but today there was a demonstration. I was part of it, but it was really nice and cozy. It was not a hard demonstration. It was not so rough, but uh, people gathered really to uh, show we are uh, many who really need something, how to be part of the society. But, you know, we are used to live a precarious way of life. We are used to it. But now everybody knows in Austria, maybe not in the US, because in Austria we discuss it now. And this is great that this now reaches another uh, public, public uh, uh, another publicity. Yeah, this really focus on we have the artists, we think we are a culture, a nature of culture. So, but where is the culture? At the very end of the bottom line, after everybody gets support, then maybe there is a little money left for the artists. Well, excellent. Let me let me jump. Sorry, um, it just ask you a follow up question here that I'd like both of you to answer. So it, it is related to public art, and um, in recent years we've seen that immersive art has become one of the most dominant trends in the art world. It's suggesting that people are kind of saturated with the life online and seem to long for shared experiences in the physical world. And my question to you guys is really drawing on the current crisis. Is the corona crisis disrupting an art movement that brings people together in the real world, or is it simply accelerating an inevitable retreat into virtual reality? So, Neil, would you like to go first? Um, I'm... Um... I have a side project called SPC, which works in public art and institutional art as well. So we've been doing a lot of research in that realm. Um, I think what's interesting about it is um, it, the technology was so easily adopted and co-opted by um, advertising and marketing uh, entities that this idea of immersive art, uh, you have to dig through a lot of shit to get to the valuable uh, work. Um, <laughs> we've seen uh, substantial examples of that in San Francisco with uh, various um, museums and uh, galleries uh, or, or, or shall I say marketing projects being um, disguised as museums and galleries. Uh, some of them have survived, others haven't. Obviously everybody in that space is locked down right now. Yeah. But the positive side of that is it actually moves the conversation about experiential art, immersive art, whatever, um, boardroom term we want to use, um, it moves that conversation into a broader sphere. You know, my analogy is always, uh, when I went to design school, nobody knew what a font was. And then the, you know, the public, the, excuse me, the personal computer uh, made that an everyday word. And you'd be hard pressed to find anybody on the street that doesn't know what a font is. So from that standpoint, 
Um, I think it's good for uh, the medium as this uh, social gathering, um, experiential, immersive, whatever term you want to use, ex expression of art. I mean, frankly, this has existed for a, a long period of time, you know, outside of the performance space. I remember going to the carnival in my small hometown in New Brunswick, Canada, and they would have uh, the equivalent of an IMAX, which was just an inflatable um, stage that you would see a wraparound film of someone flying a, a stunt plane, you know, things of this nature. So, so that, that aspect, that aspect of being fully immersed has existed for 40 years. Uh, right. the, the, the uniqueness is the ability to um, bring people together uh, and have those conversations in, I guess, more of a technological environment. So. So, yeah, um, I mean, so, so it, it has been accelerated through technology, right? Because the immersion is, is getting, is feeling much more real, but it's still attached to the physical realm. So that's kind of inherently part of this experience. So do you think that this um, is being disrupted or was it never the intention to gather in the, in the physical space? In the first I mean, place? I think, I think it's, it's more of a reset than a disruption. I think we were sort of, at least, you know, my view is of a very active, um, highly um, transitional society here in the Bay Area, as you guys know. Transient, I guess, is the best term. So uh, we were, uh, we had loads of this kind of content thrown at us before the fine art community um, really understood the not only the confines but the possibilities within it as well so it became this um it became this bastardization before it even had time to figure out what it what it was so yeah. I, I i'm hoping this is a reset which will every, mm -hmm. make everybody look at candy licious and decide if that's really art or you know work that victoria is doing or joanie le mercier or you know uh, yeah. oliver ratzi all of these people as these social commentaries, these gathering space uh, interests that can only happen in a physical space. So I hope it's a reset rather than a setback. If that yeah, makes we'll sense. see. Okay, Victoria, what is your take on that? Yeah, um, I think that public space is really very important. In the moment we know it's because we know what happens if we cannot enter it, if it is, uh, if it becomes a dangerous zone. So, um, and I think we just have one really tough experience now through this crisis, what it means to be isolated, yeah? And the totalitarian systems always worked with that to isolate people, yeah? To gather them in isolation and not uh, letting them talk to each other, interrupt communication. And now we understand that this public space really is absolutely necessary as the art, as the arts to really start communicating. And you can be ensured now that you meet somebody who is a stranger and still it remains peaceful. This is an experience we all forgot. Yeah. We always are together in worlds that we uh, can trust. In my home, it's everything is okay. But there is this other space, this public space, that has really other meanings for us. Mm -hmm. And so now this art, the arts know how to use it. And of course, through the arts, we have this little thing that we carry with us. It is infinity. It is maybe eternity. And it is immortality. So within the arts, we carry a medium that is much stronger than every politics. We already forgot about this impact in the religions. So this was also very, very strong throughout the years. And now we have it and we keep it. And within the arts, we have another second tool. We can start and really set new beginnings. Mm -hmm. We do so just really new sites, really new kind of um, spheres, atmospheres, not only atmospheres, but these kind of sites really express that this is a very new, brand new experience. And so it is a kind of a new birth. And we can ensure the people it is possible to really 
set a new, set a next step and set a new beginning. And this is the hope we carry, the hope. And this is combined to this kind of, however you want to call it, infinity or uh, eternity or immortality. And this makes us so strong because we as the artists always forget that we have these bodies that have a lifespan, a certain lifespan. I want to, in the, in the very last uh, question to you, and we have to be very brief because uh, time is running out. Uh, we, I want to do touch about uh, the actual physical uh, artists and their current condition, uh, because they've been among the hardest hit uh, in the crisis for all sorts of reasons, which we all know, and I'm not going to go into, but uh, looking into the future and Victoria before said, there will always be artists even in some part of the world. But if, if we look uh, at uh, the current situation here in the Bay Area, in Austria, all around the world and think of how hard they have been hit, uh, is, are we doing enough for artists? Uh, and I'm talking about a society facing the future. Or are we actually in danger of losing uh, not only artists, but uh, a really important uh, element of our well-being in our society. And I start with with Miro, but really brief, maybe in, in one sure. or two sentences. Yeah, so um, I think that we aren't doing enough as a society. I think that there are individuals who are trying. Um, I know all of my businesses are associated with um, emerging art um, niche uh, perspectives, marginalized communities, and we're trying to build tools to, you know, use this wide audience that we now have to give them a voice. Uh, the problem is, is when you get at least, again, my perspective is an American perspective, West Coast American perspective. If you, um, there's a huge disconnect between what's tr traditionally been supported by civic society and the new art that's being created. There's also a problem within the art systems about what is high art and what is not, all of those things need to be abandoned and society needs to accept that this is part of the holistic so social experience and this is enriching uh, as much, if not more so than sporting events. I urge people to read Richard Florida and a few others. And um, so, th yeah, I think, I think society needs to do more. I think civic government needs to do more. Uh, what you guys are doing to inject art uh, into the corporate scenario is hugely relevant and should be about enriching the corporate culture and not about coming out with an end product that's sellable, things of this nature. So is that helpful? Wonderful, <laughs> Victoria. Cool. Yeah, for me, I made the really best experiences in the moment I can really connect to politics, religion and everything else. So if we as the artists are really at the top level on discussions, on debates, invited to debates where we can really talk to the heads and in open space, not only in the background, yeah, then it really helps because then the arts, the artists will be visual, will, uh, will be uh, visible and then we can also set our statements on the, in the right places and for a public and I think this is what I really want to I want to cooperate with journalists, I want to develop projects with politicians, but on the same level, on an equal level. Mm -hmm. Then it would start really to get to, to become interesting because what should the society do? The society does whatever they can do, yeah? yeah. It's not so easy. It's a, which society, which group of society, the, the ones who really uh, don't even know how to survive themselves, they are interested in arts most of the time. To those who are not so much interested, they have a lot of money but don't spend it, so what? Yeah, uh, I think the moment we can, as the artists, approach the middle of society, which is now empty, and it's not only empty, it is a hard gap, yeah? It's a very tough gap, but we can build nets. I'm not afraid of these gaps. We can build bridges, we can build nets, just take us into the middle and that's it. And we will win. <laughs> Excellent, that's a wonderful statement. Again, mitigating also this uh, ongoing entrenchment of, in our society. I also love the fact that has been stressed by Vika and Gefried that art should be introduced in every aspect of life, politics, every aspect of our societies, civil government, whatever we can, just infiltrate every aspect. We are up for this at Open Austria. So thank you so much, Miro. Thank you so much, Victoria. We'll see you in a bit. 
And we'd love to introduce our next guest, our next and final guest, um, Eva Schäfer. She's a career diplomat in the Austrian Foreign Service and a very dear colleague of ours. Um, she currently serves as a, as a director of the Austrian Cultural Forum in DC. We invited her to talk about a project that we have been working on together for the past two months. It's called No Place Like the Future. It brings together artists from Austria and the US that have been separated due to the pandemic, but united now in this project as an artistic collaboration online in order to imagine a better future for all of us. So hello, Eva, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Beware, you're on silent. Okay, now I have technology and its little traps. Technology for diplomats, you know. So we learn a lot. We're in the process of figuring it out. All right, so let me ask you the first question. If a, I remember very clearly when you approached us two months ago and the three of us together came up um, with the concept of this project, No Place Like the Future. Um, would you have thought that together with our dear colleagues in New York and Los Angeles, we could inspire so many interesting, diverse, and internationally renowned artists become being one of them from both sides of the Atlantic to imagine a no place, a utopia for humankind after Corona? No, first of all, let me also say thank you. Um, thank you for, for inviting me and for, for being part of this fascinating um, panel. Um, I was really inspired and, and, and was listening to all of you for the last hour and, and uh, now I can feel of, uh, you know, uh, profound to, to give this uh, diplomatic uh, comments at the very end because I feel so inspired by the artists. But I think <laughs> it was a little bit our, our idea when we started to think about uh, this project uh, two months ago when, as you know, every, everything was in a shutdown and everything went down and, and, and uh, we here in the embassy were mainly, or most of us were, 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 were focused on bringing Austrians back to, who are stranded here, bringing them back, working with consular issues. And me being the director of the Culture Forum, we were like, here, okay, what are we going to do now? We have to cancel all the events and everyone was in shock and the artists couldn't come anymore. And then the question was, well, what is our job here as a cultural diplomat, as an embassy? And then we came up, uh, let's, let's create something new. And, and, and I think that is when we were, were talking together and we brainstormed. And I think in the end, what we wanted to do is find a way to, 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 to stay active and to keep artists engaged. Uh, and I think that what happened afterwards, that this dynamic, this project took, this huge thing that came out of it, um, this enthusiasm, we, 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 we got from all these different artists how they wanted to participate when we started first to reach out to them informally to find out if they would be interested in doing that because you never know. Um, I think that is, I would not have and I think you guys also would not have imagined back then. Um, I think we were just having the right idea at the right time um, and uh, we're very happy about it and I honestly believe that what made it so interesting and why the, the, as you already were saying, why the enthusiasm and the response was so, was so great was this whole idea of, because I hear a lot of artists talking about that constantly and even now in times of crisis, the idea of collaboration and cooperation, to keep that going, um, in particular in the time of, of the shutdowns we had and, and, and here in the US still have more than, than in Austria and Europe, um, it was always about we are stuck and we still need to cooperate, we need to collaborate because only by cooperation and collaboration we can create a new future. And so we did this with this project because we created or recreated um, those partnerships that the Austrian and the American artists had and they were interrupted by the crisis and then we said okay let's bring them together again and let, let, let's, let's ask them to, to think for us and with us. Um, yes. And I think by those dialogues we did, we had, those of you who have seen it on the, on the website, we had 17 pairs, uh, sometimes trios of artists from the United States and America and, and, and Austria put together. And they were fascinating dialogues. I mean, we, we have been part of these dialogues. Some of us moderated it. Um, we could see them, we recorded them there on the website. And I, I think it was fascinating to see the diversity and the creativity of all those artists. Um, some of them were talking about humor and laughing, how important it is to create an utopia where humor and laughing and positivity stays. Some were just 
just were talking mainly about technical questions of how are artists we're going to do that in the future how do we survive how, how can we perform and then there were those who were having spiritual discussions spiritual elevations of thinking of this future can only be in a better way if we start with ourselves among ourselves the healing has to come from inside of every single person and only then um, there is a real utopia possible and so for us being a diplomat i think it was fascinating um, um, to do that and at the very end we were also able to ask the the, the artists and pay them i think it was important to create art together and uh, that is what we're gonna see hopefully very soon they are they're creating art pieces together mm -hmm. and we're gonna show them on the website uh 18th of june just already making some announcements um hopefully everyone is gonna be there we will show them um online with a big virtual gallery tour and we are very very excited about that Ava, no place like the future.org that's the website where you can watch the projects on june 18th as you just mentioned our finissage so please uh, go on the website stay tuned on this really exciting project i want to ask you one last very short question we asked everybody you know about the future um of what they're you know specialists in what they're really good and the future of art in general uh, the future of music the future of literature now uh the three of us, we are kind of working in diplomacy, right? We work in cultural diplomacy, more precisely bringing uh, our world with the world here together. Uh, and that's, of course, very difficult. Cancelled flights, uh, people confined to their homes. Um, so uh, let's say, let's assume that this is going to go on for a while. What, what are your personal feelings and on the future of our trade? What's the future of cultural diplomacy? Well, first of all, I think diplomacy as such is not bound to physical contacts. For me, the idea of diplomacy is more um, a state of mind, a tool, a way of thinking of how to approach things. So I think the idea of diplomacy is to connect people, to connect countries, to connect ideas in order to increase a mutual understanding among each other. And that not necessarily needs to be interrupted just because we cannot physically see each other right now or not in the same way. I think cultural diplomats, our job is to connect artists, to make them create work together, get to know each other, um, have in particular then establish a long lasting sustainable relationship. Um, and by that, you increase the mutual understanding of different countries, of situations, of cultures, of societies, which talking about uh, the topic of, of today is exactly what then we need. Also that feeds back into a political process, uh, or at least it should be to think about if this understanding is there and there are new alternatives and new discussions are coming out. Um, that is something that we as diplomats should ne would need. And I think right now, maybe the physical contexts are not as possible but as we also see with this technology and the new technology um, there's always new ways to adapt but i think our job as cultural diplomats is more or less to bridge that gap that right now has been appearing with this uh, physical distance and we have we are like gatekeepers for me a little bit we are sitting as a gate on both sides of those countries in our host country and in our own respective country we have context to artists and art institutions on both sides. And so the only job I think we have to do is to connect those ends. And the rest then I think goes very freely and easily. And as we have seen with our project, there's a lot of enthusiasm that this then brings out something really, really very beautiful. So I think our job is still gonna be there. It's still gonna be easy to be doing. Um, we just need to need our creativity and think what diplomacy is all about connecting people. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so please check out our finissage on June 18th. Um, among the prominent artists that we have featured is, for example, Vikram Chandler, among um, others like John Malkovich, um, Erwin Wagenhofer, Hufert von Geusen, and lots of um, artists that are just on the rise, incredibly relevant and wonderful pieces. So please come and check it out. And with that, we're going to wrap up the session with all of our panelists. And we'd like to ask you one final question. Um, it's easy because you just have to finish a sentence. So let me um, say that sentence out loud and then I'm, we're going to go the round. So please complete the following sentence. When this is all over, I imagine a future where... 
Eva, you want to start? Sure. I would think um, where hopefully everyone is more conscious about how precious life and life on this planet is and that we all start to think a little bit less only about ourselves, but more a little bit about others and our communities. Wonderful. Ilana? Microphone. Yep. Ah, thank you. Uh, I imagine a future where everyone has equal access to basic rights and can exist in public safely and where the world and the systems that we've created work for all life on this planet. Precious. Vikram, what's your response? Mm, I imagine a future where there is more justice, more solidarity, and more delight. <laughs> Wonderful. Miro? Turn on the microphone. Sorry. I imagine a future where uh, artists are recognized for their uh, involvement in the fabric of society and are respected for their position. I love that. Um, Gefried and Victoria, your microphones are off. Gefried? Well, I hope that some of what we are learning right now, how important it is to take care of each other and how wonderful are these possibilities to connect all over the world, that we really can transmit this also in the future and really understand that the probably strongest power that we have in the arts is our connection, our networks, and working together on these goals that we formulated so often today in a global network. Thank you. And Victoria, final statement? So uh, I would change it a tiny little bit. When this is all further, I imagine a future where all the world, the celebrities, the politicians, the journalists, and the communities just ask on the street, please, where is this nomadic institute for peace-building arts that could help us working on the social world peace? <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. All right, everyone, um, that the wraps end. it up. Yes, I would like to thank uh, you guys. If I imagine a future, it is a future where all of you are very, very present in working with us uh, on many, many more projects. Uh, today's open salon, really with uh, some of our dearest uh, collaborators talking about the art of the future and bringing us a lot of insights. Uh, we're going to continue our series, Open Salon, so please stay tuned. Thanks all of you for participating. Uh, and uh, we will be able to uh, watch the recording uh, of this fourth edition of the Open Salon uh, on YouTube and on our Facebook channel. Thank you so much. Tune in Thank for you. Our next Thank salon. you. Bye bye. Thank you. you.